Hello, and welcome to the King Heroes Journey podcast. My name is Beth Martins. I'm here with Mike Wilkerson, who I forgot to ask if I spelt everything right in your uh, name there. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Oh, no. It's Stellium7 with a, with a U. You were oh, close. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't yeah. Notice it. I apologize. And I actually did notice. Um, Another place I spelt it wrong. My my brain like really late last night. I'm going oh two L's. Darn it. Yeah. So now I I miss. Okay. So I'm gonna just edit that quickly so people know how to find you. It's uh, it's interesting. Your your handle is very good for some reason. I always remember it with a quick mind, and uh, and that's not always the case. Handles are almost always not. Um, you know they can't come to your mind, but you you just nailed it with your Stellium Seven. And I think you told me, well, well, I said at Brockfin, why don't you tell me how that came about? You already mentioned it. In yeah, it was an accident, really. Well, I, I um, grew up with a mom who was an astrologer. So astrology was always a, a pretty integral part of my, my youth. And um, I was always fascinated by the concept of a, of a stellium, which is when you have three or more planets in a, in a sign or in a particular house. And it's just really like a focal point, a concentration of energy. And I have a five planet stellium in my seventh house so um i always like the number seven as well i don't know are we recording maybe this is good for, <laughs> for this is good oh this, this is, is good. okay yeah, yeah we're yeah we're totally so we're live. um so that was my email address for many many years and when i started a youtube channel i didn't know uh what to call it and i just thought oh i'll just call it stellium seven and uh I didn't, I didn't ever think for a moment or anticipate that people would start to be calling me Stellium, <laughs> which is, it's kind of, it's kind of fun. All of, all of the, my family members have SS as their, as their initials and mine are MW. So I'm like the oddball. And then a few months back, it occurred to me, wait a minute, I'm, I'm also an SS now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> right. Exactly. Seven. There you yeah. go. Oh, that's really fun. Uh, looks like we have a problem with streaming to uh, Vigilante TV. Darn it. It worked last time, so I have no idea. We'll have to go back and just upload this to it later. We are live on Rockfin, and I have shared a link in the chat here if anybody would like to use that platform. And we're live on Rumble as well, so I can grab a link for that. Give me a second to make a probably um, rude noise here. They always come on. There it is. And I will grab this link. Always get my best numbers on Rumble these days, which is nice. That means people are going away from the mainstream platforms more so. That's good. All righty. Yeah, yeah, super good. And uh, hello to people on uh, Rockfin as well. Music Guru is there, a friend of yours, I think, Mike. Yeah, excellent. Hey, yeah, I, I recently downloaded his. Uh, what the heck is it called? It's music for um, the the right hurts or something. True solfeggio. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. True. Yeah. True solfeggio. Right. Yeah. True self. He's got self number two coming out very soon. I got an early listen, and it's amazing. So. Oh, fun. Okay, People good. Well, I'll be on that one as well. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we should plant a bug in uh, in uh, Music Guru's conspiracy music, ugh, music Guru's ears about an event that's going to take place in the UK coming up in September. And with any luck, we'll have you there, Mike. Oh, that'd be super that good. That would be fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm, it would be I fun. I like to meet people in real life. <laughs> yes, Instead I just know. Just being behind a screen all the time. Right, right. I'm grateful for the screens, but when it can go next level and be flesh and bones, and that's why I was really glad to meet you in, in Arcapulco. I know we didn't have a lot of deep talks, but I was around you when you were having deep talks, so that I remember. <laughs> in uh, those uh, nice, often early morning, everybody's out with their coffee and rubbing their eyes from the night at Max's bar the, the night before, where I didn't go, actually. The mornings What's are great. Dip, dip in the sea, a nice breakfast, you know, hanging out with awesome people around the breakfast table and then off to the conference. It was, it was perfect. <laughs> it really was. It really was. Yeah. I loved your recap as well, Evan Arcapoco. That helped me a lot because there's so much that you miss ah. when you're in those live settings. So many things happening at the same time and people I didn't really get to know. 
So yeah, that was uh, that was great to get your get it through your eyes. And, yeah, it was, uh, a, so it, was a, it was it was awesome to to be able to be there and to meet so many people that I really admire and to, to actually be able to hang out with them and, and get to know them and, and uh, exchange ideas. It's really a special experience. It was one of the warmest groups I've ever been part of. I have been playing and speaking at festivals for a lot of years as a, as a musician. That's more how I was doing it in the earlier years. And I was always struck at how incredibly, um, you know, what is the word? Just, just not warm, not friendly, not kind, um, you know, and, and these are not even really like high level people. They're folk musicians or they're, you know, it's, it's not, it's not like they're such a big name that they've earned that, but the, the snobbery and the, you know, who are you and, and all this kind of, I remember there was one time, I'll just say a really quick story. Then I walked into one of the um, backstage green rooms and they were singing a song I just happened to know. So I jumped in and I started singing uh, harmonies thinking, oh yeah, this is so fun. And I'm just, I'm just like a little kid. Oh yay, I know the words. <laughs> and you should have seen them glare at me and look at me <laughs> like there's some problem. And oh, I'm just so grateful that this group was infinitely more open and humble and, uh, you know, great, great speakers would come up to me and introduce themselves. Hey, I like your podcast. And I'd say, Oh, what's your name? And they're like, Oh, Topher Gardner. I'm like, Oh, I should have known that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the humility goes a long way. Yeah. A lot of humility, a lot of just openness to ideas. And I didn't know what to expect, you know, from an Anarchapulco, an anarchist conference. I wasn't sure what the vibe of the people were going to be. Are these like, you know, going to be like gun toting, you know, <laughs> kind of people that hang out in the in the hills? Or it was uh, it was such a nice. It was a family environment, you know, children, and just peaceful and and really great. So yeah. I highly recommend it if anyone wants to go to a, an awesome event. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Me are you well. are you going to Music and Sky also? Are you? I am you... not. No, I'm oh, heading okay. to Texas pretty soon. I'm actually going to be doing a live interview with Alex Zek, who's hosting me. So um, yeah, I had to pick my pick my events, and I'm going to take mm. my son. And we're going to. He likes to visit the open carry states, so that's uh, he's pretty excited to get some cowboy boots and eat brisket. And where's home for you? I don't even know where what part of the world you're in. Here in Manitoba, it's uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. In Canada. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. There you go. And you are in? I'm on the Costa Blanca in Spain. Nice. And how did you end up in Spain since we're just getting to know each other? Well, let's see. I started as an exchange student in Italy in 97 and uh, lived a total of three years there. And then from there, I, I moved to Sweden and I lived in Sweden for, for 10 years. And then moved down here 12 years ago. So it's been I've spent almost as much time in Europe as I as I did in the States. And Fantastic. Uh, yeah, and I did my chiropractic training in Sweden when I was when I was up there. And that was a five year training. So that's what I do here in Spain. I'm a, I'm practicing as a chiropractor. And uh, all of the other stuff is just kind of on the side hobbies, interests, and things that I dive into out of just pure interest or passion. Right. Yeah, that's so fun. One of the uh, bits of feedback that was given at the event at Anarchapulco, I have no idea if they're going to hear this or not, but um, that there was you know so much variety in the education there and the presentations in a lot of different areas and spirituality and the science and the medical side of things and from your side to the uh, history and geology, if that's what you spoke about. And, uh, and, but there wasn't the physical, right. That the ability to develop yourself in a physical way, whether that's through chiropractic or some kind of, um, you know, like uh, I, I'm thinking of Matthew who was there and he had the, the two trees set up with the apparatus that you could go for a like kind of acrobatic swing in. Did mm -hmm. you, did you catch that at all? I didn't. I saw it, but I didn't try it. Um, okay, I tried it. Yeah, I was really scared of it, so I <laughs> so I, I thought, okay, 
The flying, exactly. Yeah, I was scared of it. So then I thought, well, I must do it since I'm scared of it. And I lasted four entire minutes until I was going <laughs> to, the whole thing was going to, oh, my yeah. lunch was going to come up. Yeah, yeah. But it was really good. That, I was glad I tried it. That kind of stuff doesn't usually bother me. I was a hang glider pilot for 10 years in California when I lived there. And I would, you know, when I had enough altitude, I would do some acrobatics as well. So I, I loved. Uh, it's like being on a, a radical roller coaster ride, but you make the track as you as you go. <laughs> right, right. So. There you go. Yeah, that's not uh, not exactly my wheelhouse, but I do like to get out of my comfort zone, especially physically, because uh, that's a good thing to do. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with Mike's work, I'm just going to say for over a decade, he's worked as a chiropractor in Spain. He was just telling us where his mission has been to help improve health, one spine or mind and mind at a time. Mike has always asked unconventional questions as a teen computer hobbyist turned hacker in the early 80s. His thirst for deeper knowledge led to wild adventures with some of the top hackers in the nation. In 1985, the fun ended with a brief incarcer incarceration for his infiltration of computer servers at Microsoft and three other Seattle corporations. Definitely would like to hear more about that. Uh, and uh, has interest in examining the unquestionables never waned. Uh, in the decades that followed, Mike evolved from mischievous hacker to benevolent backcracker and in recent years on independent, uh, as an independent researcher. His research and presentations are available on his channel, Stellium7. I'm going to grab that link and put it in the chat as well. So uh, super glad to have you here, Mike. I'm glad we are here. Do you want to start off with a story about how you ended up incarcerated? I have one too. Wow. Um, <clears throat> yeah, as a teen, uh, I, I was fascinated with computers and got into the telecommunications side of it long before the internet existed as we know it today you know it was modems and dial-ups and and uh so i was already doing that when i was 12 and 13 and and uh eventually figured out how to make phone calls for free and and i could access computers and bulletin boards all around the nation and then i started to to meet people with similar interests and and that led to some kind of crazy adventures that I've I've written a book about that's the book is written but uh it's not polished yet totally and uh the marketing side is is something that I've been dreading for years so it's like 35 years in the, in the making and still hasn't been published so I that particular project I seem to have a really hard time completing but um it's a it's an amazing story. Anyone who's heard it is like this should be a movie because the, the wild things that were happening. But yeah, so when I was eighteen, I just turned eighteen. I got caught in Seattle, and I had been getting into all kinds of computers that were not mine. <laughs> and uh, eventually, it caught up with me, and there was a court case, and it was kind of a big deal. It hit hit nationwide. Uh, you know, broadcasting and, and lots of front page articles. And, and, um, and then I started a new chapter of my life because I wasn't going to be doing things with computers anymore. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't trust myself. So I thought, I thought the temptation would be too great. So I just started doing odd jobs and worked as a temporary secretary and worked in restaurants and in a deli and all, all kinds of different things. And just kind of started a, a normal life because from, basically 13 to 18, my life was anything but normal. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just kind of went into the life of a normie, but I, I didn't exactly grow up a normie. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by your channel and the, the theme of it. Uh, I, I didn't know about your channel even after we met <laughs> in, in Mexico. Uh, I watched a, a few interviews and uh, I love the you know, the idea of the, the hero's journey and, and the, the archetypes. This is something I was deeply interested in in my 20s. I was reading the works of Joseph Campbell and, and uh, Jean Shimoda. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Goddesses in every man and God, gods, in every, God, gods in every man, goddesses in every woman. It's the idea that all the archetypes are, are contained within us. And uh, so I, I very much identified with the, the, the hero's journey as a as a young man 
um, not just because of the crazy things that, that were happening to me, but also uh, out of interest when it came to reading and books and, and growing up with a, a parents who were into astrology and the tarot. And, and my mom at one point was a, a book buyer for a new age bookstore. So I, she fed lots of interesting books to me uh, at a time when I was, when I was very, you know, open-minded and curious. And so the, the hero's journey for me, I mean, I always, from the time I was a little kid was a bit of an outcast. Um, I had an unusual upbringing. I had a very different uh, name. <laughs> my my name was was Princeton when I was uh, that was my birth name, and then went by Prince because everyone always shortens the name. And uh, when I hit grade school, it was a little too hard to to deal with the the pressure that that I got from that. So I, even though I loved the name, I, I ended up leaving it behind. And um, you know the basically alternative everything was kind of my upbringing <laughs> when it came to everything from diet to mindset to religious perspectives and uh, so that just carried over into my interest in computers and eventually you know i got smack on the hand so i i, I went to jail for that i was 18 i had just turned 18 so i was i was uh charged as an adult and um, it was oh. Microsoft, Sunstrand, Kenworth Trucking, Boeing. <laughs> it was a, it was kind of a crazy thing. So it, there's a little Wikipedia entry on on me, but uh, it. Uh, there yeah. you go. <laughs> what there you can go. I say? Yeah, nice. It was. It was. It was kind of. It's a. It's a. It's an interesting chapter in in my life and uh, of many. There you go. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I was uh, right away when you started talking about it. I wanted to read the archetype that uh, that was there, or that's just how my brain works is looking for those those kind of uh, patterns. And so my my question right away uh, wondered if it was the rebel archetype because it's the one that um, doesn't mind getting a smack, doesn't mind risking getting a smack, I should say, and and that can mm. be part of part and parcel. Uh, if, You're talking if, about like your your quiz on your on your web page. Yeah, yeah. Did you yeah, do I it by the way? I took that. Yeah, I took. Okay. I, I did the quiz. Yeah, what was I, your was, I was the uh, the nurturer. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Which is yeah. Inter interesting. I mean, the you you described it in your little short video about that archetype. You said it was the last of the first half of the cycle. Exactly. So that in the zodiac, that would be the 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 sign of Virgo, obviously the sixth house, ah. and I'm a Virgo, so <laughs> so that fit. And Virgos are very much nurturers, and you know, oftentimes they'll they'll go into healing professions and that sort of thing. So I've I've uh, focused a lot of my life on that. I studied massage when I was in my twenties, and then went on to to chiropractic, and and that's what I do for a living. Is I touch people and try and help them in, in, you know, both with the up here <laughs> and in the body. And uh, so if it felt appropriate, the, the nurture. Fantastic. But, uh, that, that, that's so cool that you did it. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know what the other seven are, because you said it was your own, your own take on, on the archetypes. And uh, yeah, the archetypes came through me at a very poignant uh, moment of loss when my father died. And uh, it was a couple of years later after my mom died, they both kind of went as a pair, that I started looking and seeing, are these archetypes in fact the hero's journey and not just a soup of archetypes like I had been experiencing them. They were all there in varying degrees. I'd already done some work on it. And then when I conceived of the possibility through... Um, What's her name? I don't know if I can see the book. Um, I'll have to get that out of my memory. But uh, she wrote a book on the archetypes of the hero's journey as well. And uh, so after I read that, I'm like, I wonder if my archetypes are a journey. And within five minutes, I could see how they exactly lined up perfectly as a sequence that was meaningful in, in a particular order. And then mm -hmm. I found myself on the journey and I made one of the biggest steps I'd ever 
made in my life or one of, one of the big steps I've made in my life. And I was able to make huge changes just by finding myself on that journey. So that's what gave me the clue that this was very important, not just, just to know who you are, but where you are, what's behind you, what's in front of you. And uh, yeah, the nurture is, is one that's really super close to my heart. And as a matter of fact, I've just created a training on the nurturer specifically. So see if you could relate to this, that uh, there's a phenomena I call the nurturer's pendulum swing. And it's where you go from helping, <laughs> right away you can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know where this is going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Helping uh -huh. everyone, crashing, burning, helping no one, telling everyone to get away, recovering, helping everyone, crashing, Fit, burning. Fits, fits and starts, as they exactly, say. Like, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And it can really, it's very strange for the nurture because the will is to serve and help, but because it can be, you know, from a shadow place, it injures you, then you just, you develop a very strong aversion to it, even so much so as disowning it. That's where I was at when I found my nurture archetype. It was disowned. I didn't even see that about myself. I didn't, I, I had no persona whatsoever around being a helping spirit, but, um, but there it is in Technicolor. And now uh, many years later, it's, uh, a lot of those nuances have come clear. So you might want to join that training to get some some tips. It it goes Look beyond the surface. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a free one. There's going to be a course after. I will share a link I'll grab uh for people that would like to join. They uh, I just opened it up yesterday. It's gonna take place May 15. All right. So that's enough about that. We were gonna talk today about history, about a word you coined called geobiology, which I really like. And biogeology. <laughs> Pardon me, I got, it, I got it backwards. Biogeology. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Works both ways. Creative license yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And um, and yeah, the alternative hidden histories that, of course, we haven't been seen. Gigantism, catastrophism. I really enjoyed the video about petrification. That is so different than anything we've been told. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I would like to know the implications of that. Where would you like to start with all of that? Well, it, it, the whole thing started for me about what eight or nine years ago. I met uh, you mentioned Alex before. Um, I'd already, from my twenties, been interested in the whole conspiracy landscape, and uh, my my father gave me a couple books: "Behold a Pale Horse" and another one called uh, "The Emperor Wears No Clothes." And and that opened my eyes to a lot of the, the different power structures that existed in the world and the interlocking societies, both secret and open, and um, and how you know the educational systems were were hijacked and and the medical system and and so for me um, I've always kind of had an open mind to a lot of that stuff and I went through different phases where I would you know feel higher or lower degrees of paranoia and like maybe it's time to head for the hills and you know collect weapons or something like that but it wasn't my my interest or my style so i never i never you know did that i decided i'm just gonna you know go on and live my life and do my best to try and help help others and leave the world a little better place than it would have been if if i wasn't in it and um that was that was kind of my motivation i figured you know, a lot of that stuff is on, on a level that it's difficult to affect any kind of change other than, you know, in your own, your own sphere. So um, that kind of thinking wasn't, wasn't new to me, but when I met Alex, uh, I had already been digging into a lot of different subjects that, that were kind of unraveling the tapestry that was my, that was my upbringing and, and my worldview. And, um, you know, looking into the music industry and Hollywood and how how uh, compromised they were and the, the, the deep cultic influences uh, in in those those industries. And, and um, as I as I was going through that, that's when I met Alex and we started checking off the boxes oh, 9-11 and, you know, you name it. And this is obviously before uh, the uh, pandemic came into into our experience, and uh, so he started asking me at one point if I'd ever looked into the the flat Earth thing, and and I, my first reaction was, "Oh no, 
you didn't you didn't just go there <laughs> of all places you know it's that's like the one thing that you're just an idiot if you're even pondering it or or contemplating that that uh that the earth might be flat and and so i did, i just brushed it off and it took uh him bringing it up again a few weeks later before i decided to put in what i thought was going to be five maybe ten minutes of time to pull up the evidence to debunk this ridiculous idea and uh each of the things that i brought him got shot down pretty handily and uh he started you know presenting me with different examples of of uh things that didn't really match up so i don't identify personally as a flat earther because i think it's a it's a term that's very um divisive and, and weaponized. weaponized it's a false dichotomy that's you know specifically designed i think to get people arguing amongst each other and uh that really the the nature of the earth might not might be unknowable ultimately we we don't you know unless you can get outside of something you can't really know what it is <laughs> and uh doesn't seem to be anybody doing that right now um but um i I, th I think ultimately that the true shape of the earth is, is a synthesis probably of, of uh, both, both a sphere and flat and uh, possibly a toroid. And I, I have lots of different ideas about it, but I think the important thing uh, when it comes to that is the intellectual exercise of going through the process of, of finding out like all these things that I believe that I grew up believing and that I thought were truth, do I really know them to be true or have I just been told they're true? And that's where, you know, the, the studies that I had both in high school and in, in college were, were beneficial because I learned logic. I learned, I learned, uh, you know, rhetoric, logic, um, you know, grammar, these, these different, these different bits that that help you to to analyze arguments and and to to look at them and, and judge them based on their merits and then uh, going through chiropractic college there's you know heavy emphasis on the scientific method as well and and how that should be done properly <laughs> and uh, and so the you know when when this came along instead of pushing it away and I'm talking about earth shape again. Um, I thought, well, this is, you know, this is a fun, a fun thing to, to ponder. And the deeper I got into it, the more I realized this is a truly deep subject and it's not, it's not dumb. And the things that we were taught are our truth and are the proof that we live on an earth. That's, you know, the way they tell us it is, those things are debunkable and they shouldn't be. <laughs> so it's like, Hmm, you know, so it, it was a, it was a huge, um, upheaval for me because it came on the heels of of these other uh things that i've been diving into that had me really questioning the, the nature of our reality and what's really going on here and um and then when i got into the the earth shape thing it took me six months really to wrap my head around it before i was uh confident you know at least that i knew what it wasn't and um and that was pre uh pre-algorithms <laughs> so you know it was it was developing organically when people put out good material it was it was recommended and others you know liked it and shared it and uh there was a natural growth that was happening to the channels that were sharing that information and, and you know if you know about the subject at all and you know what happens when you do searches now it's you just get a bunch of bs <laughs> that's all designed to make you think that it it's a ridiculous idea that's not even worth your your time pondering and i never understood that because i thought wow this is a great tool for debate skills you know in in school like one side takes the ball and the other side takes flat and see who wins you know but no we're everything that they do is to is to 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 get you to not look at it and i thought that's fascinating so i'm i'm always interested in looking where they tell me i shouldn't be looking <laughs> It's just kind of who I've been my whole life, really. Yeah, and that that's the rebel archetype, by the way. So there might be some default in in that one. You, we are all archetypes on the hero's journey at the same time, which is why I do the quiz. So there can be mm -hmm. some measure of focus and points of entry for, for doing work on awakening those shadows. 
But oh. uh, but yeah, especially your upbringing. And isn't that classic? Yeah. Sorry, when I geek out on uh, on the archetypes here, but isn't that classic? How you had you had more of a rebel upbringing, right? Your your parents were already outside the box, and they're already feeding you, you know, books and and knowledge about something alternative than than what the mainstream has created. And then, and then you made your way into the more normal world from there. Yeah, and doing right, doing Definitely. things that were <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, and and as far as the archetypes go, I mean, the one that I that I identified most with growing up was was the trickster, was Mer Mercury, Hermes, um, and you know the the different gifts that he brought and gave to humanity were, were things that I identified with closely. And, um, I was, I was fascinated by the, the Tarot as well, because this, this idea of the fool's journey that not the first card, but the zero card is the fool and the fool is stepping off the cliff, uh, you know, looking off at the sunset and not really paying attention to where he's going. And boom, the adventure begins, you know, because he's, he goes <laughs> over the cliff and, um, I, uh, when I, when I made the decision to move to, to Europe, it was, you know, actually the second time, not the first time, uh, first time I went for school then I moved back and I finished my degree in California at UCSB. Uh, that was, I wanted a classics degree, but they didn't offer it. I, I, I didn't have any clue what I wanted to do with myself when I grew up, still don't. Um, but, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to study a lot of different subjects to just get a feel for what, what was out there. And um, so I started as a philosophy major. They didn't have classics. So, so when I went to Italy, I, I switched my major to Italian and that allowed me to just take whatever I wanted to while I was there. So when I, when I moved back to the States after that, I decided I was going to go back to, to Italy after I graduated and sold my, my car, my van, my hang glider, my motorcycle, you know, I just like all, all my toys and, uh, and bought a one-way ticket to, to Italy. I figured I would teach English when I got there. And, and, um, when I did that, when I made the decision to do that, I was sitting high up on the mountains that I would usually jump off of in Santa Barbara and fly. And I was thinking about this, this idea of, of flying and how it's really a metaphor for the, the hero's journey, every single flight, because you, you know, you, you prepare, you have to train, you don't just like grab a hang glider and, and jump, you know, <laughs> it's a good way to die. Um, you know, and you've got to be, you know, very familiar with your gear and set the thing up and, and then you get up to launch and you need to know the conditions and the micrometeorology of it. And, and then, have that that courage and faith in your equipment that you're gonna you're gonna jump and and fly and not die you know and so so i thought well that's kind of a metaphor for for life and a metaphor for this this um thing that i was about to do which was to move back to europe and i and i didn't know where i was going to go at that point i was i i had just turned 30 and um so i wrote a poem uh i don't know if i, I it's a short one i, I see if I can oh, remember yeah, it uh, properly. Yes, so, so it goes, um, it's called the void and it goes like this. If I can remember it, it says, uh, I have come to the edge at last with thoughts racing and heart beating wildly. Just a few steps. I don't know. This, this is it. I tell myself, this is where I discover who I truly am just a few steps and then I'll know. Am I meant to fly or to die like so many broken heroes dashed upon the rocks of the great abyss below? And there in that eternal instant, I look down only to see that the choice has already been made. The hero has just taken his first steps forward. Wow. Oh my gosh. How much synchronicity is this right now? <laughs> Which is a big part of your uh, fascination as well. That's um, what a beautiful poem got shivers all over in oh, the resonance of it. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah, nice. It was, it was, um, 
you know, it's a, it's a lot to leave and you never know, you know, where, where it's going to go. I never, I never move back. <laughs> so right. sometimes, sometimes you make choices that, that, uh, change the whole course of your life. And, and that definitely happened with me. Yeah. And what a great metaphor of, of just stepping and knowing because that they don't call it risk for nothing. I was just talking with somebody about that this morning that, uh, you literally don't know things could fail whether it's your equipment or your judgment or uh, the, the what, you know, elements change suddenly, all of that is possible. And that's what stops pe most people from actually taking the risk of going on their hero's journey and putting themselves out there and doing something that they're called to do, which is not everybody's called to, you know, jump out of airplanes and that kind of thing. But uh, there's a, it is a good metaphor for how we feel when we face those kind of risks. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really yeah. fun. I like so, that. yeah. So back to your original question. Um, mm -hmm. So meeting, meeting Alex got me, you know, looking at the world through new eyes and really examining things that I had taken for granted as, as, as true and, and long ago proven. And the more I, I dug into them, the more I realized that there were a lot of things that, that weren't. And, uh, you know, I, I was a big space junkie and interested in, in everything sci-fi and love Star Trek and Star Wars. And, and uh, so <clears throat> if, you know, if someone had come to me earlier and started talking like that, I would have just brushed him off as, as an idiot, as a lunatic. And, uh, but I was already, I was already digging into a lot of things and, and aware that that things are not necessarily as they appear. And the more the more I looked into that one, the the more it just started to change my whole perception of reality. And that got me looking differently at lots of ologies, not just cosmology or you know astronomy and these kinds of things, but but also geology because I realized that well, you know when you start looking at the big bang and then gravity and uh you know light years and all, all these all these things that that at least i grew up taking for granted were real um it's it's not necessarily the case <laughs> and uh and so that that opens the door to a whole lot of new learning and there there were so many things that i was uninterested in as a kid, because I just thought, oh, that's the most boring thing ever. You know, geology, rocks, digging up rocks or archeology, span you know, there with the brushes and, and sweeping away the dirt, you know, and looking at stuff that people, you know, some settlement from thousands of years ago. I was like, for me, it was all about the future. It was all about getting off the planet before it was destroyed by a comet and all these kinds of things. And so I, I didn't have an interest in that. And, and when it came to you know the perennial teachings the, the 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 philosophy and the the religious perspectives that i grew up with it was um it was something that always gelled with what i was studying as far as like quantum physics and i, I always felt like every every time i got deeper and deeper into the science thing it was looping back around on on the ancient teachings and i always I, I grew up believing that there was a thread that went through them all and that n none of them was completely right. And, uh, and so the, you know, I, I was a selective sifter and I would take what I wanted from one, one thing and, and from another. And, uh, ultimately, um, I, I didn't know the word syncretism, but I was just a natural syncretist. And I, and I have a, I have a lot, I, I have a very, intuitive side as well. I'm extremely logical, left brain, Virgo, typical Virgo kind of person, but I also have moon and Pisces. So I'm a very emotional person as well. And I have a lot of, a lot, of, a lot of intuition. And one of, I think my gifts is pattern recognition. And, and obviously sometimes we can think we're recognizing a pattern that doesn't actually exist. That's called apophenia, or we can see something uh, have a visual pattern and think that something's there that isn't real that's called pareidolia so i was aware of these things um 
long before I ever started looking at geology with new eyes. And um, so I started to, initially I, I, I did an investigation into a mountain here in Spain. It's called Montgo. It's a, um, it's a, it's a five kilometer long mountain, three miles roughly, uh, 750 meters high. And it looks a lot like an elephant. <laughs> and it's kind of a silly idea to think that a mountain might have once been an elephant. That, that would require a completely different worldview. And um, interestingly enough, that worldview is in alignment with ancient mythological views and even religious texts which is that there were great beings that that once lived you know even the mainstream uh geological model acknowledges megaflora and megafauna you know that everything was much bigger back in the day they talk they talk about the dinosaurs and meter meter large dragonflies and, and that that kind of thing um but obviously they're all they're, they're putting it in this context of 14 billion year timelines and you know supernovas and all you know and then everything just randomly bangs together and then boom here we are you know as rob skiba used to say from from goo to you by way of the zoo and uh <laughs> so i've got threads going in a lot of different directions but <laughs> as i as i investigated this mountain it, it initially it was just a fun exercise intellectual exercise i got on google earth I'm looking at it from lots of different angles. And I started to recognize that there were a bunch of different things that actually lined up with the gross anatomy of, of a creature that could be an elephant. It could be some other mammal. Looks a lot like an elephant though. And uh, so I started pulling up elephant anatomy and looking at elephant skulls and looking at, um, there, there's a cave in the mountain that's exactly where an eye socket should be. If, if this portion that looks like the head is, is actually ahead. The, there's a cave exactly there, so that was that was fun because I'd been up to it a bunch of times and I never really pondered that it might be something you know crazy like that. So I I decided to approach it in a really analytical way and I pulled out anatomy books and I got online with 3D anatomy and I had a laundry list of things that I would expect to find if there was any truth to the idea, and then I went up to to document that investigation because initially it was just an overview and you know the head was in the right place and there was a there was curving in where the the shoulder the, the head meets the shoulders and there was a deep canyon between the between the legs and you know it was just like after after an hour or two i was finding a whole bunch of things that that lined up that shouldn't be there you know it's like after a while you start to have to look at the probability of something and mm -hmm. and um so that that un quite unexpectedly became a, a two-year investigation. Uh, there's a multi-part video series on my channel called Unveiling a Titan. Seven, seven chapters to that. They're about a half an hour long, most of them. And um, yeah, investigating the eye, investigating the ear, looking at the, the histology of, of the mountain, which is the, the medical term for tissues. Um, and by by two years in i documented over 50 anatomical correlations both both on the micro and the macro i got a microscope uh thousand x microscope to examine the 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 stones that were on and you know comprising the mountain and it, the the number of of things that lined up and the specificity of those things is just either the universe is playing a joke or we're in some kind of a simulation that starts to adapt itself as you look at things, which is definitely a possibility, or um, or there's something to it. And most of the people who get through the the series, there's that's the full series there. That's the the playlist. Um, yeah, there's a there's a 90 second just little visual teaser that that presents really all of the data that I present in the first four videos is in that 90 second teaser, uh, just to kind of give people visual impressions before introducing the ideas to them. I suppose you could think of it as brainwashing, but <laughs> it's just uh, just to help people to, you know, a lot of I, I come from a, a medical background. So the, the terminology is 
is easy for me and to remember it. And, you know, I, for example, the, the socket there, obviously those tusks, tusks, by the way, those are photoshopped. It is, it is Photoshop, but it, it, it has to be. Uh, so um, you can see the, the cave there, the, in the, in the eye yeah, alone, I there's about 20 anatomical correlations and some of them are highly specific. And I document those all with photos and on site with video and I'm comparing it side by side with the anatomy. So it's not like, Hey, it kind of looks like it, doesn't it? It's like, there's a ton of stuff that lines up. Um, and, and so that was how the whole channel began. And, and it's interesting going back to astrology, cause, uh, that's been a important, you know, part of, of my life growing up. Uh, I went once to an astrologer in Seattle and uh, a, a guy, he was, he's, he had written several books. Jeff Green was his name. And uh, he worked out of a bookstore in, in the university district. And I, and I dropped off my chart and I was just like, hey, you know, curious to know what you think I'd be good at. <laughs> you know, like, what, what do you think I should do? Because I wanted another opinion beside my mom, you know, uh, <laughs> who was the, the resident astrologer at home. And uh, he, he came back with something that kind of puzzled me. And it wasn't until a, a couple of years ago that I realized how right he'd been. Uh, his, his, he just said photojournalist. It's like, you should be a photojournalist. And I'm not much of a journalist uh, as far as writing and writing articles and that sort of thing. But the channel has really been documenting my adventure as I've pondered these different ideas that many would consider harebrained. And... Um, I've done that, you know, documented that both in sharing my thinking around around the idea and my approach to it, but also with, you know, photography and, and video. And, and uh, so that's, you know, the channel is a real mishmash of a lot of different things. There's some stuff about the hacking on there. There's the there's the tight knowledge. I, I coined the term technology just just tongue in cheek. Right. Like somebody asked me, like, what are you? You know, because they're trying to figure out what my background was. And I, and I jokingly said, I'm a, I'm a titanologist. And uh, later I coined the term biogeology. And the reason I, I, well, the term was already being used, but I appropriated it. It has to do with an exchange between the lithosphere and the, the ecosphere down here and, and, you know, exchange of materials. And I thought this is a much better way to, to really distinguish between um, what we're told about geology, how old things are, how they form, you know, what what the underlying processes are versus alternative views and and the evidence that may or may not be there for those alternative views. And uh, a lot of that has to do with petrification, especially rapid petrification, because, you know, we know that that organic things can petrify. We have petrified forests. There are creatures that can be found completely petrified. Um, but those are, the timelines we're given are millions, if not hundreds of millions of years. And these are timelines that nobody can witness them. No, no one can, they can theorize about them and then they can, they can make claims about dating or they can infer uh, and, and draw conclusions based on chemistry. But ultimately, you know, they're, it's, you know, they, they're, they're making it's a lot dodgy. of claims that are not substantiated. <laughs> it's dodgy. Yeah, yeah. I had a professor in, in anthropology, which uh, archaeology was part of, and uh, it was on epistemology. How do you know what you know? Let's question how you mm. know what you know. And that was the, the thread started unraveling for me and realizing. And of course, every time they make a claim about a date of, of the age of something, it's got a, 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 a astronomical plus or minus on it. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you consider even the range and, and then, you know, it, in short, do you think the, the history that, well, the history is different, but the geology is a lot shorter than we've been led to believe. And, and why would that be? Yeah, I, I think it's much, much shorter. I mean, I'm, you know, there are young earth creationist Christians that, that believe the earth is five or 6,000 years old. I don't know how they arrive at those numbers. I don't, I don't have a clue and I'm not asserting any particular age to things. I just think in general, things happen uh, over a much shorter period of time than we've been given as far as the mainstream model goes. Um, and, 
certain things like like when it comes to petrification there's a whole variety of different ways in which things can petrify this is what i was one of the things that i talked about in in mexico uh my my talk focused primarily on the evidence for the great trees you know think think avatar sized trees trees that were a mile wide or, or larger at the base and stretched up who knows how far um you know is there is there actual empirical evidence that 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 such a thing once existed can we see the signs of that and um you know how could that have possibly come about and a lot of a lot of that is theory you know and catastrophism you know you look into these different different uh the mythological and historical perspectives surrounding you know the the rise and fall of of empires or civilization you know because they're even the mainstream geological model talks about five different great dyings off where you know the there's the comet strike or the asteroid strike that supposedly wiped out the the dinosaurs 65 million years ago that's just one of five different ones that they've identified you know there's the one that took out all the trilobites and you know so they've got these names and they've got you know they 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 give us dates based on their 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 chemistry and their spectroscopy and then they have the the sedimentary layering and then they claim the age of things based on which layer they're found in um, but you also encounter circular reasoning where they're claiming the age of the layer based on which fossils they're finding in the layer so uh, there's there's a lot of, a lot of different things that are now peddled as fact that were hotly debated and then eventually you know this is this is what we're going with <laughs> and I, I don't know what your background is if you've if you've studied formally but if you get into the whole the scientific method and peer review and you know the the gold standard which is the double blind ras randomized controlled trial or, or the meta study um you know what you're looking at ultimately is peer review so you if you have a, an idea that's incredibly um destabilizing for a particular paradigm and your the peers that are going to be reviewing your idea have a vested interest in not having their paradigm crushed <laughs> chances are you're not going to get published right <laughs> like if you know 20 years ago if you tried to go and and say einstein was wrong or gravity doesn't exist the way we were taught good luck even today <laughs> you're not going to have a whole lot of luck, uh, you know, getting getting those ideas through. Um, so it, it's been interesting as a chiropractor, the, the whole profession has been under attack for a century uh, from the, the American Medical Association. And and, uh, you know, there's there's a landmark law lawsuit that that was brought against the AMA, which the AMA lost <laughs> for uh, antitrust violations because they've been trying to eliminate my profession for decades and they were jailing chiropractors for practicing medicine without a license and you know all, all sorts of things that um are just part of the, the historical record now but most people are unaware of them and they don't realize how those events have shaped the world and our perception of things like health and uh what it means to be healthy and how health is achieved that all we have a we have a paradigm that's not based on on uh, reality at all, in my opinion, when it comes to health. So it, it's just an example of of the ways in which the the peer review process or academia in general can be used for narrative control and and not much more. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. When there's a, a group of people that are, like you say, are invested, that it would be, you know, over their lifetime, their credibility, resources that they've pumped towards that resources they depend on when, if that paradigm was to fall through, then they couldn't continue what they're doing. Uh, all kinds of the house of cards starts to fall apart. So yeah, mo you know, many, many people that try to bring forward revolutionary ideas, it won't take off until they're past, right? That's, hmm. that's generally been, been the way it's gone. I was just, uh, by the way, looking for, I, I did find in one of your videos called um, Talking Titanic Trees. And uh, mm -hmm. this image mm -hmm. came up. Is that, is that something that you're talking about right now? Or is that different? Um, well, this, this is something I think Chad Williams might have had that photo 
I, I think okay. it's interesting. It's looking at, you know, this, it, you've got volcanoes. I mean, one of my theories is that volcanoes, maybe not all of them, but many of them are, um, are the remains of, of trees. And, you know, we have lava tubes and, and these, these snaking, you know, network of, of, uh, tube structures that transport lava question is how did those really form? And I, my, my suspicion is that whatever, whatever caused the, the damage that you can see very clearly across the realm. Like if you're looking on Google earth and you look at something like the grand Canyon, what you're seeing is, is what's known as a Lichtenberg figure, which is, if you think of, uh, lightning or a tree structure, the branching, the, the way, you know, the way our lungs are, are branch off into ever smaller channels. That's what a Lichtenberg figure is. It, it's, it's got that, that branching fractal quality to it. And that's a, that's something that is a sign of electromagnetic or, or plasma activity that's scarred the earth. And we can find examples of that all over, all over the realm the the goal, the grand canyon being the biggest of them um and that that is um something that you can experiment with in a laboratory people people take electrodes to wood and burn these shapes into the wood and with that that burning comes an alignment of different elements along those lines as well so um the the great the the evidence for the great trees i've i've done multiple live streams it's it, there's a ton of it <laughs> it's not just this looks like a tree there's like amazing uh things that and none none of them in and of themselves are are conclusive proof that those trees existed but each of them is a data point and if you start to look at those data points as a as a whole as a gestalt you get a pretty undeniable image of of um, a past that that has been told to us uh, was fairy tale or myth, and you know now we're way more sophisticated than the ancients were, and we don't we don't uh, try to you know anthropomorphize the you know nature because we we're so rational now, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, right. so I think I, I I've come to the conclusion that. That most of what what they give us in, in the sci-fi fantasy stories in Hollywood has a as a degree of truth to it, and what we're told is real is the real is the real fantasy. Um, right, right, yeah, that, amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that picture to me, when I see that, the first thing I think of is the great trees were taken down. You know, if you want to refer to the Book of Enoch or the Book of Jasher, they talk about the the Titans laboring at the trees and bringing down the trees because uh, they were, God requested that, I guess. Um, and then you have um, this idea of um, major cataclysm. And I think that the volcanoes, there's, there's radioactive material there that is, it's burbling and bubbling. And every once in a while it, it comes to the surface for one reason or another, but it's a, uh, it's just an idea that I, that I toy with. There's, there's a lot when it comes to the trees that uh, you, seeing is believing. And uh, I'm actually, I'm very excited because I was, I was invited to Music and Sky to present and I decided to lengthen the trip. So I'll be going to Colorado and meeting with Hangman. Uh, he's got a channel, it's called Hangman1128. And he's been doing boots on the ground investigation of, of the, the evidence for the trees for the last seven years or so. And he's got by far and away the best visual evidence, the most compelling for their existence. And I've been referring a lot to his channel over the years as I've, as I've covered these topics. So he and I are going to travel together. We're going to go to, um, to South Dakota and Colorado, and we're going to see some of these these amazing sites and and document them. And it'll give me an opportunity to interview him. And he has an incredible rock garden at his home uh, of just amazing um, specimens that he's collected that that illustrate all the different 
manifestations of of the trees and how they petrify and how they break down as they're breaking down and what they look like in varying degrees of petrification and and the conclusion that he's come to is that that basically our entire periodic table of elements is is coming from the trees and i think it it's very likely that that's uh that's true yeah rip rob skiba rest in peace he was a wonderful yeah. man i got i got to meet him in denver years ago and uh just really kind and incredibly knowledgeable and he was he was influential uh for me in in the beginning of these these investigations because of the work that he did with with the the weather balloons and and the high altitude footage and you know going across the um which lake michigan i guess to uh to you know in the boat uh seeing seeing the chicago skyline from the far side of the lake uh which at that distance you shouldn't be able to see all of it or maybe any of it and he was a he was a great man it's a shame he's gone that's awesome yeah yeah definitely um <clears throat> i was just going to say about the trees that um the, the gi gigantic trees the um the star forts and i think i've seen a little bit about that on your channels have a tree like uh, as if they're a tree base, right? That they they radiate out like the roots of trees do. Do you do you suspect those are trees? Were trees? I think yeah. I think I've, there there are actual maps that show like pyramids atop stumps, <laughs> like old. They're line drawings, you know, of of, of star forts. You have when you've got the basic star fort, which is like the four pointer, and then they, they expand and they get larger and larger from there. A lot of people don't realize it, but all the old world cities are all star citadels. These are walled cities that if you look at the oldest maps of the cities, you can see that all across the realm on every continent, they're exhibiting the exact same features. So there was a, a realm wide civilization that i think was far greater than ours in size in scope in uh, in technology as well and the star forts are a real clue to that you know a lot of people are looking into the the world's fairs and looking at the anomalies of of the the great architecture that's in places that it shouldn't be and that was supposedly built in you know incredibly short periods of time and made out of weak materials, but yet the buildings are like on the scale of something you would see in Rome. Um, so those are those are anomalous, but the star forts are that's a huge anomaly because there are literally thousands and thousands of them on every continent. And, you know, they have each each one has its own little historical tale, but taken as a whole, it you're looking at at the remnants of, of some, something very great that, that once existed. And yeah, I think, I think that they're always, they're always near a water source there. There's uh, a good chance. I think that, that they were built on top of the remains of the trees and, you know, you're going to have what they call artesian wells, artery artesian. And, and mm -hmm. so I've shown examples even on, with smaller trees where they can tap into the groundwater and, and actually have channels of water coming up through the tree where if you hit it with an ax, it starts to spurt water like a fire hydrant. Uh, wow. I've got video clips of that. Uh, you know, sometimes it'll come out of the knot of a tree. So the water is working its way up through the tree and then it's just like an, in a permanent waterfall coming from within the tree. And uh, so if you imagine you that on a much larger scale, then you would have infinite water sources that could, could you know, provide never ending water to to cities. You know that I lived in Rome for two years and Rome has amazing fresh water coming out of fountains all over the city. And those fountains just run infinitely. <laughs> it's like, hmm, where's that coming from? Well, if you think of a tree with roots extending down into the waters of the deep, then um, it's not it's not so far fetched. Right, right. 
Fascinating. Yeah, that's uh, they, they don't want us to know about how much good water it, there is. And it's not even that there is, it's that they're being made. What's what's your take on that as, as a as a more of a roamer? I don't know if we'd leave that uh, Effie <laughs> phrase out of it. But what, what mm. would be your take on where all of that fresh potable water is coming from? Is it still? Because the, I think the waters of the deep are a very real thing. Um, mm -hmm. As far as what the shape is, are we in a toroid? Or is it a flat disc? Is there an underworld? Is it hollow? Is it concave? There are all these different theories out there, and I think they're all fun to ponder. And it's interesting to look at the the evidence. I'm not married to any of them. I'm definitely a tried and true globe skeptic. I've seen no evidence mm -hmm. of, of the globe, as we were told. Um, but, um, right, but just, just about the water, say the conventional yeah. explanation is, or the, the unconventional uh, conventional explanation is that's the mantle of the earth being a fire and it creates gases and gases. One of the products of gas uh, emissions are, is going to be the um, creation of water. And that's, and that's how you end up with like fresh new water being, being created at all times. So is, is, would that be the, be the truth in, in a, a realm model as well? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, just like, I, I, I know you don't know, but like, I'm just curious if, yeah. if there is a, a thought, uh, how they, like, where they, where, where would they think the water comes from if there's no core mantle that's on fire or is there, it, does well, that destroy they're, they're, they're talking about oceans of water being found in the deep and, you know, but it's mixed with sand. And, you know, I saw an article just the other day talking about that subject. So I think they're, they're hinting at the waters of the deep that that you know it's possible that our our continent our continents themselves are just floating on on these waters. these great great waters you know and makes sense if if the the great trees are comprising our continents then then maybe there's you know these waters that are that are floating the continents there there's a interesting video of a submarine have you seen that where they go down to the bottom of the, the, the sea or the ocean and then and then they they see a, a lake at the bottom of the ocean <laughs> and they try and descend into this lake. But the, the mineral content is it's so it's so thick that they basically the submarine just like bounces off of it and then ripples go out to the to the edge, just like, you you know, we would see at the shoreline here. Uh, I suppose that could be fake, but it seemed it seemed pretty, pretty real. Um, so who knows what's down there? I, 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 it's fun. There's so many, there's, it, this place is so mysterious. Like when you first go through this process of like, oh, okay, maybe space is fake and they're lying about this and it's all Hollywood fantasy. It can, it can leave you a little depressed if that was a big part of your, your way of seeing the universe, because then it's like, okay, well, we're, we're in a fishbowl, you know, but the more you dig into things and the more you learn, this place is far more far out and interesting than, than that model ever could have provided us with, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You not know, boring. I, I've, I've learned more in the last five years and encountered incredible teachers that I wish I had known, known of when I was in my twenties. Cause I, I spent so much time studying stuff that I now consider to be, you know, falsehoods. And uh, you know, I, I just, in the last two years, I came across the work of Walter Russell as an example, um, and you know Rudolf Steiner and these these uh, these great thinkers that that wrote hundreds of books. You know, in in some cases, that it's just like we're not taught about this stuff at all. So um, every, every day is a new adventure, trying to take it in and, and relearn. But it's also daunting. You know, when it comes to matters of religion and, you know, I, I cast out the Bible and the Quran and these other things as superstition. And, yeah, they held grains of truth, but it's not like I need to pour over the texts and really understand them to make sense of what's going on here in this realm. Um, but I, I had to swallow my pride uh, when I started looking into the, the earth shape topic and realize that there's a whole lot that I don't know. And there seems to be all kinds of things lining up historically with these different texts that that I thought were archetypes or myth or parable or, you know, just um, fantasy. And I don't think that anymore. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's a liberating thing. So the one thing I was thinking about with the with the water, it's it makes sense that we are we would be floating continents, but it's all salt water, not fresh water. And when you know waterfalls go off or springs, you know, it can be literally anywhere. There's a, a beautiful spot where I used to go to a festival. And it had this incredible little tiny spring-fed lake, and it was always crystal clear, and you could drink right out of there. And it was a beautiful, like, no smell whatsoever. It was constantly being refreshed from the earth. Mm. And it's like, ah, where is that coming from, right? Like, we need to know. Mm. <laughs> and and our controllers don't want us to know that that's happening. So. That's well, and water, water itself is so incredibly far out. I just learned, you know, in the last few years about the, the fourth phase of water, structured water. Uh, I, I learned a little bit about it from the work of Masuro Imoto years ago. Was it The Secret or something he was in? Showing how thoughts and emotion can affect water as it's freezing. And then we have the work of Veda Austin now that, that basically took his work to the next level um and is it Pollock who who has the theories related to um structured water and that the all of our you know the interior linings of our body when it comes to our capillaries and our you know our mucous membranes all of that they're all coated in layers of, of structured water like a, like chia seed you know when it's been soaked and so and, and learning about victor schauberger and vortexing of water and the you know these are the kinds of people I'm talking about. Like most people know of Tesla as Tesla cars. They don't know anything about Nikola Tesla. I'm not even sure if Nikola Tesla really existed, um, but uh, you know, he could be a fictitious character. There seem to be a number of those floating around, but um, Victor Schauberger definitely existed. And he's like, kind of like the Tesla of water. He's just a wealth of information about how, how this place is really working. And there's, there's so much, <laughs> so much to learn and so much to know. It's indeed there is. And uh, so, how has it changed you internally? How has it, how has it changed the way that you're? I know, I think you've talked about some of it already, but I'm just curious about the transformation that's occurred. Uh, maybe even at a spiritual level, how has it changed your relationship with life itself or the? Uh, nature of a God. I know I have a, a friend, Mark Archer. Now he corrects me every time I say the word God and, and is trying to get me to say life, which I fully agree with. Actually, I'm just uh, aware that he doesn't like the word God. So I keep using it <laughs> as mm. a brat. But uh, what's your, what's your perspective on all of that? And how has your research changed you? I always believed in a God, but I had a, a an amorphous view of it. Like it, it was the force, you know, like something from Star Wars that, that, that was the, it was the ground of all being. It was the, the, the energy that was vitalizing us. And, and when a person dies, the, the body is still there and all, all, everything is still there, but something's missing. And that's that, that vital force. That's the organizing force. That, that keeps the body functioning and regenerating throughout our whole life. Um, I have a different perspective now. I, I, I believe that there's a conscious creator God that has created this realm and, and everything in it. I also believe that there's kind of a, an opposing force that, that has created like a matrix overlay, you know, all kinds of illusions that we are, taught our, our reality. Um, so when it, yeah, I would, I would say that, that I, a metaphor I, I like to use is, is a, a tornado whipping through a sand dune and, and you're not going to end up with, with a watch works <laughs> from, from this random explosive event. You know, if you, if you're walking down a beach and you see a, a pocket watch is open on the beach and, and you can see the gears and the mechanisms, especially if it's still functioning, you would never assume that something just smashed all of that sand together and came up with this shiny functioning object. And I, and I think that there's so many like examples of, of this, <laughs> this majesty of, of creation that, that clearly has, in my opinion, the, the hand of a creator there. Um, 
So yeah, it's brought me a lot closer to the creator being aware of these things. And, and then um, w after studying the mountain, I started looking at lots of different rocks <laughs> and, and like, what, what is this really, you know, is this, is this what we were taught? Is this what, is, is this what they said it was? And why does this look like it was from the tissues of a, of a creature, even though it's a stone. And uh, I started to uh, recognize a pattern in the stones that was reoccurring that, that shouldn't have been there based on just random chance and, and pieces breaking off of larger structures and eroding. And so I, that I started to um, recognize that what I, what I believe are petrified organs uh, all, all around and started gathering them and, and made a, many videos on this subject showing the, the telltale characteristics and how, how repetitive and specific they are because it should be repeatable it should be scalable. It should be specific. You know, when it comes to this sort of thing, it's not like a true scientific experiment where you have a manipulable variable because the rocks are the rocks and whatever happened to them happened. I can't recreate that. Um, somebody might eventually be able to petrify a heart in a laboratory and turn it to stone. There were people in the 1800s that knew how to do that and their secrets died with them. A guy named Girolamo Sagato and another one named, uh, uh, Bruni is the last name. Yeah, that's me showing my... <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So that's a, that's a very, very specific pattern, which I've, which I've shared with people over and over that, that I could be wrong, but it, it matches the anatomy of a heart to a T, the, the blood vessel openings, the, the lines where the different folds of the heart meet together. When the heart contracts, there's a there's a twisting vortexual contraction to the to the muscle fibers, and a lot of these stones that I that I gathered, when you look at them from the bottom, it has that that twist like a propeller, um, and so that that became a massive rabbit hole in and of itself, which led to me learning things about the heart that I never knew and I was never taught in school. There's a cardiologist named Francisco Torrent Guasp who was the discoverer of what's known as the myocardial ventricular band. And it's basically fattened, uh, fancy Latin terminology for if you take the heart and you, you open it up, you can unravel it and, it, and, it, and it's one long band and this is a this was something that I was never shown or taught in school that was a total mind blow when I learned it because it changes everything we understand about not just the structure of the heart but the function of the heart and that the heart is actually um, it's it's two vortexes that are going opposite directions and as the heart the band contracts it's it's actually functioning based on on suction and vortex not by a contraction and pushing the blood out to the blood vessels and i didn't know anything about his theories i didn't know that he had actually proven his theories proof is a that's a word you should use very cautiously you know uh what is it outlandish claims require outlandish evidence and this this man dissected hearts for decades thousands of hearts. He worked, he had a family practice. He was a cardiologist and he didn't, he didn't buy the, the prevailing story about the circulatory system and how our hearts function. And so he kept investigating that on his own for years and years. And eventually he discovered that, that if you, if you boil the heart and you carefully remove the fatty outer layer that you could, you could, um, you could just basically bluntly using using your thumbs to dissect it you could open this thing up and when i saw that it was just like this is amazing because i'd already been looking at the the realm itself and and like what is this place what what is the true shape and the 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 shape that i always come back to is the the shape of the toroid because it's in all magnets everything is growing with these these spirals, all of our plants, the, the conch shells, the 
you know, it's, it's just, it, it repeats itself all throughout nature. It's like the master shape. And uh, so I realized, well, it makes perfect sense that the, the heart would, <laughs> would also follow the same pattern. And uh, so this man proved it. And uh, he was definitely a, uh, a rebel who uh, was, was chastised and, you know, mocked by his colleagues for decades. And, and towards the end of his life, it, you know, it, it started to, to take on some momentum and, you know, he never won the Nobel Prize, which he should have. And ironically, I, I know cardiologists now and this stuff is still not being taught in, 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 the, cur in the curriculum for, for cardiology programs, which is insane. You've got people that are actually doing surgery on the heart and they're cutting into hearts to change yes, them. And they yeah. don't even understand the, the true structure of the heart. So that's what I was um, just thinking. Don't put your yourself in the hands of a heart surgeon. They, they have not less, yeah. not unless they know that it's a helical heart and that, it, that it's, that it's a, basically a dual, you know, vortex. And, and so this is amazing. It's like, and our red blood cells, you know, they, they, they tell us that, that they're shaped like, like a toroid and they're moving through these, these structured waters. <laughs> I think I, I think that what's happening is the blood is being electromagnetically propelled in instead some of way. pumped. It's not being pumped. It's, it's right. being pulled through the system uh, as a result of you know electrical potentials. I that's that's out of my realm of <laughs> expertise. But um, that was that was so incredible for me to to learn and and just you know it's like wow we've got this perpetual motion device right here. Actually, it's been Mandela affected. It's no longer here. It's over here now. <laughs> it's still tilted, but you know we used to put our hearts, our hands on our heart, you know, for the pledge of allegiance. And uh, my country, tis of thee, and it's not there anymore. You're Kidneys right. change well, position too. <laughs> okay, okay. One of our one of our guests, one of our guests here, Michelle, would be very happy to hear you talk about that from the most heart. I uh, <laughs> I've turned away from that. But uh, it's now, a controversial subject for many. But. It is another one of those polarizing that people fight over and stuff. So I end up just backing out of all of those arenas and uh, yeah, just try to stay in my lane, do my work, do what God tells me to do. And uh, if I'm in the midst of all kinds of fighting, I can't find the time for creating and generating. So that's, uh, yeah, this has been a very interesting conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, there's uh, I, th I have a feeling we could go on and on, and uh, no doubt you would be an amazing fit for the the conference in the UK. So I would love to see if we could get you there. That would be fun. If anybody is uh, just as a little bit of a heads up, little where the the name came in the other day, we're calling it Holy Shift with a W H O or W. So it's both holy and whole at the same time, uh, even though it makes yeah. the spelling of that word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's going to be really interesting, and um, it's funny. I, my my, I, I've been taking some notes while you're talking, and and my eye keeps going to the trickster. And there's something that guides me to just talk about that, since it was one of your favorite archetypes. It was also very much one of my favorite archetypes. I in fact did an entire directed studies for one of my years in anthropology on on that exact figure, through um, you know through history, through art, through. Um, Theater in particular was was a very big part of that, and oh, that's uh, interesting. You said theater at that moment because I was thinking of theater at, <laughs> at the exact moment you sent it. You said it, so synchronicity right. there. I did a yeah. bit of theater in in high school, and uh, my the, my favorite role that I played was was the role of Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream. So there's your trickster, right? The the uh, the mischievous uh, uh, sprite elf. <laughs> Um, and uh, exactly the the Hermes that uh, I've always adopted that role of the trickster. It, it can be a couple of different expressions. One is the tricksters will do everything you're not supposed to, so people can see what happens when you do what you're not supposed to. They're literally the contrary. Or we know the people that come into every conversation and they have to say something against what you're saying. They have to. There's a hard wiring in them that needs to contradict what you've said. Even if they believe it, there's part of them that just wants to uh, ruffle the feathers and play in that arena. 
And in my system, I, I include the trickster energy, even though I know it absolutely, uh, you know, deserves one of its own. But just for the sake of simplicity, I included it in my alchemist because the alchemist turns once enough healing has taken place and you can begin to use that trickster in a more purposeful way rather than a, um, you know, the way that the, a rebel ruffles feathers for no good reason at all, just because they want to get a rise out of people or they want some bad attention, then you become more of a master in, in the trickster arena. And you can teach through that trickster energy and have people learn from you in a um, more than an intellectual way, let's say. Hmm. So anyway, I just felt like I wanted to say that. Yeah. Yeah, Anything I was thinking more? about the different stages of the the truther journey, you know, because because th we throw around the, the word truther and you know being awake very flippantly, because uh, yeah. every time you wake up, it, yeah, I heard you in in one of your pre presentations, you're talking about you know the the spiral is that you go through these different stages and then you you get to the the final stage which is peace. And then the next stage is apathy, <laughs> you know, because you just, you, you, you keep, you know, you're not, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be in a loop, but, but, you know, we're going to, that's just the, the nature of things. And, um, it, I forgot what I was, what I was going to say about it, but, um, that's okay. We started on the it, texture. It, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. That's all right. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> there you go. We'll leave that one open ended, and and yeah, that spiral. It's it's a really good thing because what you're talking about the heart is it's like two spirals going right. The mm. the band. Yeah, and you got the, the 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 red and the blue, which is the you know the opposition, and uh, and those are uniting in in a singularity. Is is from what I can tell is that you know, once it stops working, we stop working, <laughs> and uh, you know the. One of the things that's gone through since the very beginning of my channel um, to now is is there's been such a high degree of synchronicity when it comes to my investigations and things that have re revealed themselves to me and things that I've found and the timing of, of, of things lining up in ways that are just the odds would be astronomical if there wasn't some kind of a hand at work or a providence or a little nudge like hey go in this direction uh and that's that's accompanied every every point of this journey and so that's where it really is kind of like a photojournalistic uh bearing of the soul as i as i go through these these different questions and you know kind of doing it in in the public sphere um one of the biggest synchronicities was that after i'd already made a bunch of the the videos on the mountain um, and then learned about the nature of the heart, which was utterly mind blowing for me. I um, found out after watching documentaries on this this cardiologist's life that that he lived and worked in, out of his home through his whole career, and his home was on the foothills of Mont Go, this mountain that I had been investigating. So, like the one guy in the entire world that really um unlocked the Gordian knot, you know, untied it. <laughs> the that um, you know, the great knot that Alexander comes up and slices it with his sword. That's kind of what what uh Guasp did with the heart. And but he was doing it very carefully, whereas <laughs> Alexander the Great just went through the whole knot and now he was the king of Persia, I guess, is how it worked. But but um you know Guasp was carefully dissecting and eventually he figured out how to untie the knot. And um, th that that he did that right here on on the mountain that I had been making all of these videos about was just unbelievable. And eventually, I met his son, made a video about that as I you know showed him, presented him the the stones. I've now met um, two doctors who have both worked with one of his good friends who was the first person to start a, a heart transplant center in Spain, a guy named Manel Ballester. So I've met two people randomly unrelated that are both doctors and have both worked with this man who was good friends with, with 
Francisco Torrent Wasp. So there's just like, it's just been one thing after another. I've done entire streams on the, the subject of synchronicity. It's not always easy to, to, to interpret the meaning of, of the synchronicities, but when they happen, there's no doubt that something's happening. I, I, I've got live streams where I've just told stories. I think, you know, if, if I were to sum up like my, you know, what do I see myself doing if I, if I were to like, right, right, right now I'm, I'm in the, what's that stage of the hero's journey refusal of the call. <laughs> I've been, I've had, I can help you with that. <laughs> I've been, you know, I've had a lot going on both in my personal life and, and uh, professionally and, and then with this channel. And so uh, I work in fits and starts. I always have, there's a, there's a lot of, mulling over and thinking and pondering and taking in information and then then when i do something it, it you know it tends to go well and it happens pretty quickly but it's not a consistent effort so um i think uh there's if it wasn't for the synchronicities and it wasn't for all of these these taps on the shoulder that i've gotten i would have you know finished what i did and then walked away from the whole thing i'm mm -hmm. i'm very fickle in my in my mind when it comes to interests and I, I get really interested in things and passionate about them for a while and explore them and then i i don't master them because i'm I, <laughs> i'm interested in something else that comes along so um that's that's kind of what's happened uh with this with this thing is that i've just i've been led to it and I don't exactly understand what it all means. And I don't even know which things I'm right about and which things I'm not. But I try and be as intellectually honest as possible and methodical in, in my approach to examining this stuff. And I think that's what people have appreciated about what I've done on the channel, um, that I'm not trying to shove ideas down their throats and, and make lots of grandiose claims. I'm, I'm saying, hey, <laughs> this is this is what I've been looking at. This is what I found. You can decide for yourself if there's anything to it. Uh, just one last little thing with the heart stones is I had already been gathering a bunch of heart stones and making videos about them before I ever came across the work of, of Gwasp. And when when I saw this video documenting his life and he unraveled the heart and he rolled it back up, at the point where he rolls it up, there's these meeting points of the different fibers that go in different directions. And those are called sulcus lines. And when I saw that, I realized that many of the stones that I had gathered already had those lines, but I never realized that there was a uniformity to them, that there was a, a, a repeatability. <laughs> and so I went out to, you know, I got, I got the, the stones and I started pulling them out of the closet and looking at them again. I'm like, holy shit, there's a <laughs> these lines are in the right place and they're curving the right way. Like it was just one more, like check off the box on that one. And then later I realized that, that you could look at them from the bottom and you could see, cause I, I, I saw videos of, of the heart actually contracting and it does this little dance when it's contracting and that the, the stones, they've got that on them as well. So it's just a, you know, and, and, and that led to all kinds of, questions like how can this be and why would these be outside of the body and 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 no trace of the body where how is this possible and i so that's that's led to all of these other questions and some some i've found answers to and others i'm like maybe someday we'll know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah just on the uh, subject of synchronicity that it's uh, you know call it breadcrumbs from god right that uh, we we do need signs if you if you go along and and there's no magic of any kind i don't like the word magic very much anymore but uh you know there's no there's no spark there's no like oh wow i was just looking for that and then this whole thing came my way or oh three people sent me information on the same thing today or oh i met mike Wilker wilkerson at several points and uh, oh look he's in spain and we're looking for speakers and in, in the in, uh, in europe at least and uh, and so yeah those those synchronicities are are super beautiful and important and and they they seem to as if come and go and a, lo a lot of people will get attached to them like they they want that and they call it the flow state it, like it's a state of mind to be achieved and i don't think it's like that i think that um you know in your in your co-partnership with god you are 
braving and risking the acceptance of the call rather than the refusal of the call. And it's the acceptance mm -hmm. of the call that brings in the synchronicities because you it's like walking off a plank. Sometimes I'd, I've had that exact vision where I am blind, but I'm walking anyway. And, and going, okay, God, are you with me on, on this one? I didn't can't see where I'm going at all. And then there's, oh, a little, little clue here, little clue there. Some of the clues don't lead anywhere except to the knowledge that that's not the path. That's the synchronicity. Yeah, I was just going to say exactly that. Yeah. yeah. I had a crazy yeah, uh, synchronicity <laughs> with that was related to Graham Hancock uh, before I met Alex and started contemplating that the world might not be what we were taught. I was deep into, you know, the alternative theories that Hancock was promoting on, you know, Joe Rogan and in his books and, and I, this whole idea of the comet strike and the younger dry ass and, and all, all of these ideas that, that I found very interesting and compelling. Um, and so he was coming out with a new book that I pre-ordered. It was the only time in my life that I ever pre-ordered a book. And, um, and then some time later, I came across a video of, uh, it was about Tesla meeting um, Swami Vivekananda and the two of them having like a, a pretty profound interaction that, that uh, affected uh, Tesla in many ways because Vivekananda was bring, bringing this Vedic, you know, Hindu science and philosophy to the table. And that was lining up with all of the th things that Tesla was discovering on his own, apparently. So I found this little video, it was like 10, 10 minutes long. And I thought, oh, this, this is something Graham Hancock would be really interested in, you know? And I had him on Facebook, but not as a private friend. He had like 5 million followers <laughs> at that point. And so mm -hmm. I, um, I just shot off the, the, the link and said, I, Hey, I think you might, you might like this as a, as a private message to him. And, um, some weeks later I was seeing patients and, and the, um, I finished with one, the doorbell rang, uh, I, I buzzed in the person. And at the moment I buzzed in the person, I, I, I was checking my messages on Facebook and I saw that I'd gotten a message from Graham Hancock. And I was like, what? <laughs> and so I, so I clicked on the message uh, at, at the same moment that I was buzzing in this, this person. And uh, he was just thanking me. It was a very kind little message. I, oh, I really appreciated that. That was interesting. And that he took the time to, you know, send this person a message. I was like, I was really surprised by that. And, uh, and so then I went up to go answer the door and, and I answered the door and it was, it was a, a guy bringing the Amazon delivery, uh, which was the book that I had pre-ordered like three or four months before that I had oh, forgotten wow. about. So at the, at the same moment that I opened a private message from Graham Hancock, a, got his a human hand delivered his book to me at the exact same moment. Like, how do you, how do you calculate something like that? And so, you know, that would be like, okay, that's, this is, there's truth here. And the, you know, that you, you get led down this, this rabbit hole. Well, a lot of the stuff that he says nowadays is couched in a, in a, you know, cosmological model I no longer believe in. And so I question a whole lot of the things that he says in a way that I didn't before when I was reading his books and watching his interviews. So, that was kind of like a, this is get, a, getting to what you were just saying a moment ago is that it's like, sometimes it takes you down a path so that you learn things that you then let go of because as you, as you move on to something else. And there's been a lot of times like that, where I think, you know, uh, uh, synchronicities have happened that have been crazy and you think it might mean one thing and it turns out to not mean that at all. It doesn't mean that there wasn't a synchronicity or that it didn't have some importance. Right but it right. doesn't, it's not always easy to interpret. And that's, that's been a, a real challenge through the whole thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. there, but I, I do keep a journal of them and, and make note of them because I, I, I like that they happen because it's, it's uh, outside of, you know, the use of psychedelics, which I did in my youth, it's the only real examples of supernaturality <laughs> that I've, that I've experienced in my life where, you know, it's like, you just, you can't even begin to calculate the odds on some of these things. If anyone's curious about that, I've got a stream called Synchronicity Stream and it's spelled S-T-R-E-E-M for the tree part. Because <laughs> a lot right. of the synchronicities have happened 
uh, as I've as I've gone into these investigations about the trees and the mountain and the and the heartstones. And, uh, the they're fun stories. Nice, nice. Yeah, I thought it, if I could see that really quickly, I would put a link up. But it's on the live. It's on the live. On the live some of the some of the best um, videos that I've done are are the live streams, and they're longer. I don't, I, you know. <laughs> David Weiss once asked Alice, Alex, he's like, "Does that guy know how to tell a short story?" And the answer is no. <laughs> uh, this is the one you're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, I'll just grab that link. Yeah, there there are some crazy stories in there, um, and that's that's one of the things that when it comes to you know like the the tale with the the hacking and the the book that hopefully I'll I'll get my shit together and get that out in the next few months. But um, the stories are are so wild that they don't need embellishing. You know, I, mm -hmm. when I was in my teens and insecure, you'd, I would, I would exaggerate, you know, and pad the numbers and, you know, to, to, uh, make whatever I was saying more interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and then by about 18, 19, I didn't have to do that anymore because I, the stories I had to tell were so bizarre already. And mm -hmm. that's, that's just continued to be the case. That's so fun. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, and paying attention to them is definitely a, a way to to honor them and the uh, the transmission that we we could, might call it transmission. That's really just the, just the mistaken um, difference between something that was thought of and something that was revealed. And they're not even really separate worlds, also because there is no thought without the mind of God. That it, it always is in fact generated from that source, but it can be filtered through so many layers of programming that it's lit, your, your thought literally is unrecognizable as being sourced from, from God. And mm. by, and that's, that's where the work that I do comes in, helping people to get those layers out of the way so they can just see more and more clearly and how God is always speaking, not just to us, but through us. And saying like how you know how was it that I would I would say a word while you were thinking it and just giving us those little clues that hmm, we're not separate <laughs> from each other even though we're separated by an entire continent across mm. the ocean and uh, you know you're in a totally different time zone and climate and everything like that but here we are having the same thought at the same time that's fascinating that's just to me evidence of the the sacred source of our of our being. And uh, two, yeah, two weeks ago, uh, yeah. I went for a hike with one of my patients and he asked me before, is it OK if I bring a friend along? His friend was from Bulgaria visiting and um, we started talking. And at one point I mentioned that, oh, I have a friend who lives in Bulgaria, um, lives in the capital city, Sofia. And uh, we, we continued our hike. And then at the end of the, the hike, I was like, oh, I should introduce you to, to my friend. And uh, I said my friend's name. And he did a double take. He's, he's like, he's he's a Dutch guy who lives in who lives in Sofia. His name is Barish, and and uh, turned out that they knew each other and they had once traveled together and had a really remarkable experience together. And uh, like literally the only guy that I knew in the entire country of six million people, and this this guy that I'm randomly taking a walk with happens to have traveled with him 12 years ago and they lost touch. And I ended up uh, being able to, to put them back in touch with each other because one moved off to Denmark and, you know, they just uh, fell apart. So yeah, what, what a crazy, what a crazy thing. That kind of thing is happening all the time. So I, I, mm -hmm. I hope that means I'm on the right track. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like what Lamb Chop said, God winking with us not at us, but with us. Mm. That's very nice. I like that. Mm. And Michelle said something nice here. Authenticity and disclaimers are appreciated and she enjoys their interesting perspective. So that's very good. Thanks for being here, Michelle. And thank, thank you, you for being here. Yeah. Thank you for being here, Mike. I've really thoroughly enjoyed our, our conversation. Feel free to call on me if there's anything that becomes your, your uh, next hot topic. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's one of the myths about sacred purpose is that it's one thing. Well, like there is a poem by Rumi that I quote in my book, and uh, it says, there is one thing in this world you must never forget. If you remember 
everything else and forget this one thing, um, it will, ah, oh, darn, I'm used to singing it. So the words kind of, uh, it will, it will be like nothing. But if you forget everything else and remember this one thing, you will have, darn, the singing really helps me remember the words. <laughs> Go ahead, sing it. But, oh yeah. Okay. So, um, there is one thing in this world you must never forget to do. If you forget everything else and not this, there's nothing to worry about. But if you remember everything else and forget this one thing, you will... <sighs> something um it will i need a guitar now darn it how my senses are all coordinated <laughs> it, it will be Put something you on the spot that nothing yeah something to the effect of it will it will be just nothing and and so the point so i really ruminated and studied speaking of rumi uh on this point of the one thing what is the one thing and people oh well i'm a chiropractor and that's my purpose or i'm a you know this or that and that's my purpose to me that is absolutely false and by design meant to make us feel defeated and locked in and not have access to the huge array of skills and passions and talents that make up a purposeful life. And how, you know, I feel like I've been on the thread of my purpose for many, many years, especially, well, actually, pr only consciously since I thought I was going to die and I didn't. And then, and then, oh, I'm here for something, I would have called it. But in reality, the thread of that purpose is the, the willingness to be on the journey and to take the risks and to continue growing and have your eye on bringing the elixir back to the people, what it, whatever it is that you've got that has, has benefited your life, then you're always saying, okay, God, how do I do that next level? And to me, that is a path of purpose. I do offer, offer a whole course in it, the Find Your Sacred Purpose, mostly to demystify. And really all it is, is taking the layers off of what's next, God. Because it's right there for you. It's just when we see it through all those program layers, then it becomes invisible. So anyway, <laughs> there you go. I almost got the... Almost I, got the I have, you mentioned Rumi, and uh, there's a sh very, very short little poem by him that I love. It's out beyond um, out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. <laughs> I, I love that one. And then I, I don't know if you're familiar with this this poem by Emily Dickinson. Um, I don't know the title of it, but it's super, it's short and it's it's perfect for this channel and and the theme of your work. Um, and it and it's uh, it goes we never know how high we are until we are asked to rise. And then if we be true to plan, our statures touch the skies. The heroism we recite would be a daily thing. Did not ourselves the cubits warp for fear to be a king. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice, beautiful. That's it. Have so you heard that before? No, I'm familiar with Emily Dickinson, but um, and it, and you can see how it how it plays into the ascension theory about rising, and mm -hmm. that's part of that's part of my bandwagon. Why why am I on that bandwagon? I don't know. It's part it's part of that thread of purpose God pushed up in me to talk on that subject. I'm not the only one, but um, but yeah, and the king, how it it is seems to be a pinnacle experience and yet there is more beyond that there is higher than the king that's the alchemist and there's more beyond that that is the child beginning mm. again knowing nothing again going like hello i'm lost what am i doing here uh you know so that's there's there's always an up and there's always a down but to me the the purpose of god exposing those maps to us is so that we can go through them to freedom. Because if we stay on that that upward thing, it just keeps on exposing the lower. The tree can't grow higher without more roots. 
and uh, and you end up in a trap, going higher and higher, and and in fact the the lower becoming more and more invisible to you, because you're blinded by high frequency, high energy. So anyway, that's my bandwagon that I've been on for a while now, and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. we I hire myself, and then I'll probably forget about hiring myself for that job at some point because I'm more interested in other things. And um, I just thank you so much, Mike, for being here. It's been a super, super pleasant conversation. I had a feeling it was a, a series of synchronicities that got me on your channel and looking at your stuff and like, oh, he's in Spain. All right. Like, mm -hmm. let's uh, seek him out. So yeah, I, I wish we'd talk more in, um, in Mexico. It would have been, I, I remember there was one, one talk by the pool and uh, I guess you were in the room above me, uh, or above Steve and I, and I, yeah. 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 One above. And, Someday. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It'll happen again. I have a feeling we'll have more chances. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's been super good. I, uh, is there anything coming up that you would like to let people know about or anything? You'd uh, like to promote? Well, I'm going to be attending yeah. music and sky in, um, yeah. in June. Uh, that is the 20th to the 24th. Okay. Uh, I'm excited about that. Um, presenting right. there and then, I'll visit my mom briefly in Southern California. And then, like I said uh, before, I'll, I'll go on to Colorado and I'll be traveling with Hangman for a week. And uh, one of the things I, you know, I'm, I'm cautious about making claims about, about stuff, but um, when it comes to things that you can know, I, I think that the, the great trees are one of the, the, the most important because there's so much evidence for them. It's really something that I feel you can you can know. Uh, doesn't mean I know exactly how the world was and you know what it was like before things got taken down. <laughs> but um, you know, it's like with um, with David Weiss. He's so passionate about what he does. He's not necessarily asserting a shape, but he's he's showing over and over again all the anomalous things that that uh, we were taught that aren't necessarily true. And this, the same goes for lots of different aspects of geology. There's a lot of things I think that have been hidden in plain sight. I coined the term paradigm blindness because I think that that's what all of us are suffering from in varying degrees, especially academics. The more educated a person is, the more likely they are to not realize how paradigm blind they are. They'll, they'll stick to their little niche, you know, and not want to, not want to venture too far outside of their realm of expertise because you don't do that. You don't step on the toes of your, of your colleagues or your, you know, but um, ultimately I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a line that if they can get you asking the wrong questions, it doesn't matter what your answers are. And so <laughs> when we're, when we're blinded by our paradigm, our questions are, are, it, they don't matter because the foundations of, of the reality that we're believing in, might not be true. <laughs> so that's, that's right. I, I think it's an incredibly valuable intellectual exercise to do the work, to go in like to, to earth shape or to trees or star forts or whatever, and steel man the arguments, not straw man, steel man. Because if you don't give that idea to stay in the sun and try and figure out what is the strongest argument for something and then debunk that, you haven't really debunked anything. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so this is what you see continually when it comes to earth shape or alternative geology or whatever, that there are all kinds of claims being made. And then, then evidence can be presented that goes against those claims. And that's all hand wave dismissed because we've already figured this out long ago and tens of thousands of geologists couldn't, couldn't possibly all be wrong. Could they, you, you just want to believe you're special, you know, that you, you've, figured something out that nobody else did. Well, it's not that nobody else did. It's that over the last hundred years, we've all been brainwashed to believe a certain set of, you know, what I consider lies about the nature of our reality. So the, you know, it, the paradigm blindness is, is very real. And then, you know, that leads to cognitive dissonance. And I started one last little thing I started to say before is, is there's a natural tendency as we're truthing to go into a proselytizing phase where you like you want to you want to shove it down the throats of 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 everyone around you and force them to open their eyes and 
and I think that's a, <laughs> a useless endeavor. <laughs> it's uh, it's better to just um, you know ask questions and plant seeds and and uh, be gentle because we're all at different stages when it comes to awakening, and I don't think we ever fully awaken. <laughs> yes, indeed, and uh, so yeah, no, it's. Um, yeah, I think awakening is just different. It's one of those subjects that has been completely mucked up for us and, and entrapped us in in many ways. So mm. yeah, I think we're yeah, all of those all of those things were weaponized equally against us. No no bias is there. <laughs> So I thank you so much, Mike. Uh, please, everyone, do join his channel if you if go and sub there. I know he said we were saying earlier how you go, and uh, the, some days there's uh, two subs when you heard that many, many people subscribed, and then you there's two two less. So you look and you refresh, and there's the, they're disappearing. Yeah. And no, my channel. Out. I put out a lot of content the last the last year, <clears throat> and it's the growth has been pretty much at a standstill. So mm -hmm. I touched a nerve, I think. Um, yeah. The, in the fifth Unveiling a Titan series, there I show the before and afters of editing on Google Earth, where where I was showing the eye and I was showing the the ear, and you know going in depth into both of those caves. And uh, yeah. one day I was in an interview and I was going to show this again, and it's it's all been blurred out, blurred out. So I have the before and after, and I show how it used to look on Google Earth and uh, how it looks now. So some there, there are people that have been like, well, I was on the fence about this idea, but now, now I'm convinced when they saw that because it was just so obvious. It, it's been done by hand and it's like, why just there <laughs> of all the right. places? You know, so. Right, right. My sincere apologies. I, I do actually need to start wrapping up now. I know we have more to talk about and we'll probably have more opportunities as well. I want to make sure and let people know this will be a podcast. So in usually about 24 hours, you can catch it on Spotify or iTunes or anywhere if you'd like, prefer to download a um, an audio. And I would encourage you also yesterday, I opened the door for the training that I'm going to be doing on Mike Wilkerson's current journey archetype called The Nurturer. And this is specific to the nurturer's pendulum swing, where they go from having a almost Olympic will to help everybody. And uh, then they crash and they burn because they put themselves out too much. They deplete their own energy, don't take care of themselves one way or another. And they crash and say, everybody get away. I'm never helping anybody again. And then they recover from that trouble and they run and they help everybody again. And they're, they get really high. There's such thing as a nurturer's high, which is a kind of fake dopamine and can be adrenaline rush. So I'm really committed to helping people. I know there's a lot of those in my world that suffer really consistently. Almost never anyone shows up on my door without some kind of nurturer blues or shadows going on. So I'm offering this May 15th. If you sign up right now, then you get... Uh, immediate access to the the zoom materials and that will be coming up there will also be a course to follow on the whole thing just because god kept telling me to do this mike and and it's a even a little late coming i I've, I've been saying this for a while but now i'm just i'm just gonna do it and uh won't have to be on my deathbed going i should have run the nurturer course <laughs> even if even just for myself yeah, because I'm I'm a strong nurturer and I need to uh remember these things on a daily basis myself boundaries are gold I've learned to to take more and more time for myself, you know, to be in nature and to to focus on, you know, it's as a chiropractor, you've got a your body is your your means of helping people. So if you don't take care of it, you're you know, you're screwed. <laughs> so, I know I yeah. know it very very well. So yeah yeah, it might be an interesting training for you and some very unusual things, highly nuanced. You can think it's just oh people say just say no when somebody asks you, just say no. That is not the cure by any means. And I'm going to be teaching why that is. Hmm. All right, my dear. So I hope everybody has a beautiful rest of their day. And we got a quite a jet going over, I think. <laughs> so kind of yeah, I get mopeds going by here sometimes. Oh, mopeds, not a jet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, no jets, thankfully. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, God Wonderful bless you. talking with you. <laughs> Thank you. You as well, Mike. Bye for now, everyone. Bye. Bye, everybody. Take care.